Thank you for joining me today. As you know, my name is Ben Rees, DCS Marketing. And today I'm joined by Tom Ogens and Sylvia Rissell. If we can start just by some brief introductions. Sylvia, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I'm a uh, engineer at 3DCS. I have been using the 3DCS software since 2010 or 2011, I believe. Uh, and I'm just learning to use the uh, uh, gear modeling uh, setup so we can look at those kinds of uh, parts and systems. Thank you, Sylvia. And Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. I'm Tom Ogens. I'm a, a company is called CAE Integration Corporation, and I'm a consultant with uh, DCS on the gear module. And I've been using DCS off and on during my career since the 1990s. So I'm uh, familiar with the, the product and some of the more sophisticated aspects of it. So let's Let's change topics for a little bit and talk a little bit about our, the digital transformation. You're hearing about this a lot in industry where companies are trying to complete a digital transformation. <clears throat> so this is kind of the one of the buzzwords going around right now. But really at the ground level, it's that changeover from paper, manual processes into something maybe automated or on a computer, right? So using more CAD, using CAD as the baseline. And let's talk for a little bit about how that relates when it comes to gears, testing, and analysis. So can you tell me a little bit, or at least talk about your experience and what kind of tests suppliers have to do to validate their gears in order to make sure they're making good ones, you know, for their OEMs or for their customers? So a supplier might have, say, 30 tests and 20 machines. and these machines are large, expensive, uh, computer controlled. They're run by operators. And a test could be that you take the, take the gear set and you run it in forward at so, many, uh, so much torque and then run it in reverse and do that as a life cycle test for uh, 50,000 or 100,000 runs to try to accelerate them as much as possible. Or just run the gears full out for, for two weeks yeah, so weird. they're 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 very expensive tests and you can't really eliminate them they are part of the contract and they should be done but what you want to eliminate is everything you can that would cause the test to fail before you stick it into these tests yeah so make it so you and have to do fewer tests right you have fewer tests and the tests are scheduled you don't interrupt your whole production schedule of testing mm and staff so it's a it's a large organization that has to be very flexible and do a large number of tests there's tests with microphones that you put there's a number of tests with microphones that you stick on the product and look for noise and vibe so that's probably the most um, intense effort is why is this gear set box vibrating and creating noise and vibe <clears throat> might work fine might pass through other tests but it's still noisy because uh, one thing in it is yeah. in the vehicles now is a quiet vehicle. Electric vehicles are supposed to be quiet. Why am I getting all this wine coming through and what's causing it? And of course, what causing it could be some kind of tolerance problem with the gear set that there uh, something is not uh, rotating uh, perfectly. It's a uh, tilting the surfaces are off it's, or the angle of the yes. is off or and yeah, and you have gears with the planets and a sun gear and, and four planets going around it. How much distance is is the large is the one planet from the outer ring when the other two gears are in contact? Mm -hmm. What's the angle between the sun gear and the planet gear? What's the differential uh, spindle doing to contact? To, to align the interior of the differential as this whole system is spinning around at 7,000 RPM. So these are, you know, these are questions that come up and the DCS doesn't exactly produce the answer right away, but it 
answers all of the alignment question. What is the angle? What is the distance? How are these aligned? And the noise and vibration people have a lot of uh, software that can take this information and produce the sound and produce why it's wrong or find out what the vibration is is they know what the uh, what the gears contact is supposed to be and you can an alignment is supposed to be to produce the right sound coming out of the gear system so i don't think i need to ask that a lot of these tests are either difficult or you know the the interpretation and analysis and measurement of them is has got to be pretty difficult so being able to simulate these sounds like a, a great i, I don't want to call it cheat but a much easier process than trying to set all of these up and like you said having to repeat some of them yeah they could repeat them over 20 30 times if you don't find the answer Oof. you can try a lot of stuff the idea is to takes narrow time. it down it takes a lot of time i would guess <laughs> yes yes and it doesn't and the pressure just increases the pressure to get it done the disruption increases it's very disruptive oh my goodness so you were especially a new product oh yeah right because you don't have the historical data to start off with right you have to start from yeah, scratch right. so you don't have you know uh, previous projects we can go back and say all right what went wrong there we'll just follow the same path and and occam's razor right um so yes. you mentioned uh you know, what kind of things the suppliers are doing with their machines to validate their parts and validate their gears. Um, is this similar to what OEMs are doing? Are they doing something different to validate their design or their, their system design? Because they obviously have to worry about more than the parts. They have to worry about how the whole thing comes together, right? Yes, that's true. The OEMs, well, the supplier will also do the OEM test and put the whole vehicle on there and put the microphones all around it and make sure it's performing correctly. And of course, it's called the road to lab to math. The, you know, the road from math to lab to the road test. And the road tests are you know, equally brutal. You drive them over cement blocks, you drive them across the country, they run in deserts, they run in you know, uh, Antarctica, they run everywhere. So it, it, the, gear, the systems might have to perform at minus, uh, 40 C, which is very cold, or 100 C to run, or they might have a maximum temperature of 120 C. And that really puts a lot of stress on what what is possible. And DCS can operate at all these different temperatures, especially when you have aluminum housings and steel gears and tell you what's going to happen. Yeah, aluminum is so a special kind of animal. It is. And if your gears lock up at minus 40, it's not good, or they rattle too much when you start out. Or, yeah. <clears throat> it's a very challenging environment. Yeah, I know very that. Um, yeah, just to, to make a note on that, um, Sylvia, you, I mean, are you you're familiar with uh, the finite element analysis used for those temperature checks? No, I really am not. We should have brought Maria in on this one. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I've seen some of these. So um, DC, 3DCS has a module called uh, the FEA Compliant Modeler, allows you to incorporate finite element analysis. And one of the, the great aspects of that is allows you to check deformation based on an environmental temperature. So you can set your temperature to whatever you want, and you put in your material properties, and it'll deform your materials based on that temperature, right? So that in conjunction with being able to use the gear module um, combined together, I could see being a really powerful solution for checking all of those, you know, all those factors and simulating based on, you know, different locations like the that famous the famous issues with uh, car doors not opening in Texas because the heat caused uh, the sheet metal to expand and wedge all the doors shut, or um, because they were built, you know, here in Michigan during the winter which I don't know if it's anything like today, but this morning it was like six degrees here, Fahrenheit, not Celsius, but it was six degrees Fahrenheit. So far below freezing. Um, then moving those to, you know, 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Texas and leaving them out in a parking lot for a week, you know, makes for a, a drastic difference in temperature. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. So that, that yeah, the same thing happens. 
Yeah, and I, I could see that being an issue with, with the nominal, right? You you, you got to remember that your digital twin needs to represent more than just those nominal parts and not just, you know, normal dimensional deformation, but also from environmental and um, functional and other influences. Um, so let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, so this is an interesting one. Can you tell me a little bit about the development and testing times for a new gear chain design? So when you're, you, you mentioned before that, you know, it's different if you got historical data or if you're starting from new, what is the, what does the timetable look like for these kind of designs and developments? Well, of course, it's highly product dependent, but the ones I were involved, that's usually a two or three year time period before you get everything launched. And we're trying to, and they, and you try to shut it, close it down or make it shorter, make each phase shorter. So there's a lot of pressure to do each phase faster and to automate the phases and have the workforce trained and the and specialized software developed in order to do that. So that's... That's really the name of the game. If you can get it through the whole process faster with less cost and fewer errors, then you can start to win. Otherwise, you're struggling the whole time. And it's, and it's a hard struggle. I didn't realize it was quite that long. Um, so Well, it, it, there's a lot, of, lot to it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And when the... There, there's uh, something else you mentioned I, I want to just jump on real quick. Um, so before you're talking about suppliers and they're doing the test to validate the gears themselves, to see if the gears are, are good and meet specifications, but then they have to go to the OEM and test those same gears as part of the assembly. What, what happens when the gears are test good and the gears are fine, but the overall system fails? What are what are the well, that's, what do you do? So the first thing to do is find out why it's failing. What what is going on with the gears when they're in the system? So and that's where a DCS can actually take CMM data and read it in and find out well what is everything really within spec or is something out of spec? So if it's and that's what you're looking for. Hopefully, if you've done the results before and you're You've done it through the whole range of tolerance specifications for the GDT that should be identified. Now, there could be something that's, let's say, there has a snap ring that walks out. That's not unusual. So now you got to figure out, well, why is the snap ring walking out? Is it the gears are pressurizing the housing too much that's opening the gap, and now the snap ring walks out? Is that what's happening? So that's when it comes to the maximum and minimum values of the DCS analysis really comes in handy. And also you can also look at the pressure from the CAE and find out if there's this much torque, which direction does the pressure go at maximum? And how does it open the gears? What What is the CAE saying? Whether it's the CAE from 3DCS or the CAE using a sophisticated uh, analysis, they can still use that vector they can still use that pressurized and say <clears throat> what's causing it. And then until you find the cause, you can't solve it, of course. You have to find the root yeah. cause. And then you can experiment to find out what can be done about it. And uh, hopefully there's there's a solution that will work. And you can digitally yeah. test that solution before rolling it out too, right? Yes. That's a big deal. Right. If, you, if you're if you just doing trial and error, that's time consuming and expensive as well. And, and there's a lot of aspects to even do a snap ring. You've got to get the snap ring in and out in order to repair these. And if you design the snap ring so it doesn't walk out, but you can't get it in or out, it's it's not it's not good. So it's it involves a lot of disciplines and a lot of a lot of uh, capability mm. and physical tests to, to to solve something like that. So as it's, part of this, um, do Gear assembly designers, do they currently use tolerance analysis studies as part of their their validation process or for their designs pre-production? Is that something that, that's already been going on? No, the, I, the gear design software is trying to incorporate more and more things into it, and they do sometimes incorporate the bearings into it, but they, they're still not, I don't believe, able to incorporate the parts. 
and uh, their designs are really to nominal. Their ability to do this uh, variation analysis is very limited. And also it's a much more expensive system. You're talking about an expensive system that has extreme, ex extremely qualified experts to run both from a gear knowledge and from a uh, ability to run the software and do what you want. And it's also tied up because it's trying to do new designs. So it makes a lot of sense to have a, a more general software that can solve this, that's designed to solve it, and do the specialized dimensional engineering aspect of it, than to take one system and expand it to do everything. It eventually uh, doesn't doesn't pay off just by making the system more too expensive to actually to use. Yeah. So just to make sure I understand, so what you're saying is that the current um, gear design software was already trying to do so much. If you wanted to add a tolerance analysis package directly to that. You, you would it would not only make the system maybe too expensive, but it would lock it up a lot of the time trying to do something that it's not really originally designed to do. Whereas using it maybe incorporated into CAD, where not only do you have a lot of people that can more easily consume that information, but it would make it much easier in the the overall process. Is that I mean, that, yeah, kind of what you were saying because that, that that sounds like that's what, what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, so an assembly line, they don't have one machine generally that puts the whole vehicle together, just part after part after. Generally, it goes down the line so that machine can go back to do a specific task in a specific amount of time, and it goes to the next machine. And that's the concept of assembly line. You have to kind of do the same thing in analysis and production. You can't just have one machine that does everything. It just and make it more and more expensive. It just is not a, a viable option. All right, Tom, thank you. So I, I'm going to wrap it up now. If you want to learn more about exactly what goes into a, a digital twin that incorporates the gear module, we have a webinar coming up on January 27th that will also be available on demand after the 27th. In addition to that, you get access for free to a white paper that Tom wrote for us based on his experience making gear models for customers and for other uh, manufacturers in the industry and see exactly what outputs he's talking about, what kind of inputs, and understand at a very detailed level what goes into those models. And Tom will be presenting at that white at that webinar and showcasing the white paper that you'll be able to download directly during the webinar and afterwards uh, when you watch it on demand. Tom, do you have any and final Sylvia, Sil Oh, Sylvia will be also presenting. And we'll have yeah. Sylvia as well presenting as one of our 3DCS specialists and part of our service team here at DCS. Um, and you guys will be showcasing your, your modeling expertise and work. And we hope very much that we'll be able to help some more uh, manufacturers kind of see exactly what kind of value they can get out of these models. Do you guys have any final closing statements? Well, I'd like to say that DCS is continuing to improve the gear module to do more and more complex systems and looking to do uh, not only single stage analysis, but multiple stage analysis of gear systems. It's a great point, Tom. And as we come out with those, new, as DCS develops those new, we're looking forward to showcasing them in future webinars. So make sure you sign up to our webinar series in order to stay up to date on all of the new developments that DCS is rolling out and to see those live yourself and how to, how to use them and implement them into your process. All right, great, thank you so much, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you on the 27th.